What is probability exactly? What is chance? What is luck? If you shuffle cards or roll dice or flip coins, then we all agree that there's a probabilistic element to it. But what about a game like chess, a game of perfect information where everyone can see anything and there's no explicit probabilistic dependence? You might think obviously there's no chance involved, but consider this. If I play people of about my skill level, then the amount of time I win and the amount of time I lose is about the same. It's kind of 50-50, ignoring draws. That sounds kind of probabilistic. In this video, I want to talk about the different types of probability, different perspectives on probability, and how probability can enter our lives a little bit more often than we might think. My thanks once again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. More about them at the end of the video. Let's begin with something called classical or theoretical probability. This is a normal deck of card with an equal number of 13 hearts, 13 clubs, 13 diamonds, and 13 spades. Because they're all equally likely, if I draw one off the top at random, then there's a one quarter chance that it's going to be a heart. In classical probability, we write this as the probability of drawing a heart is just the total number of hearts available, which is 13, divided by the total number of cards which is 52, and that's equal to one quarter. More generally, classical probability applies in a scenario where you have a finite number of options that are all equally likely, like drawing an individual card is all equally likely. And then the probability of a particular event, like drawing a heart here, we just take a ratio of the total number of times that that particular event could occur, in our case, drawing a heart, and then divide it out by the total number of possible events, in this case, the total number of cards. So classical probability is great. In fact, I have a whole sequence of videos on classical probability in my discrete playlist. You can check it out down in the description. But it's limited to scenarios where you understand exactly what all the options are and what the number of all the options are and that those options are finite. So what if that isn't true? Take the same deck before, but I've done some new things. I've chosen some cards on the top that I want to get rid of. And I'm actually going to put them away, and now we have this new deck. It no longer has 52 cards, but here's the thing. You don't know what cards are in it. You can no longer use classical probability. You don't know how many hearts and clubs and diamonds and spades there are. Well, one thing we could do is we could keep on doing our approach of shuffling. And let's see what we get here on the top. We get, well, a heart. And, well, we could keep on going this way. We could do another shuffle. We could do another cutting, and we could see that what do we have this time? It's a diamond. So imagine you do this like a thousand times, and perhaps you collect this data. 342 hearts, 337 clubs, 321 diamonds, and zero spades. Those numbers look an awful lot like I just removed all the spades, and it's just an equal number of clubs, hearts, and diamonds. Probabilistically, when you're drawing them, they won't be exactly 333 every time. It'll be a little bit distributed. This is the frequentist approach to probability. It says, I'm going to collect a whole bunch of different empirical data points. I'll be randomly selecting cards over and over and over again. If I didn't like this, if I wasn't convinced that it was one third, one third, one third, and zero, I could go to 10,000 draws, and it would probably be a lot closer to one third, one third, one third, zero, if that's what the deck of cards actually is. For any number of experiments that you do, you could still be making a mistake. I mean, there might be a spade in this deck. It's just that you've been very unlucky over a thousand draws to have never gotten it. Probably that's not the case, but it's possible. So the frequentist approach basically is defining probability as a limit. It's imagining you were taking these experiments over and over and over and over again. And in the limit as n gets large, the ratio of what you get, the number of events that you're trying to measure, divided by the total number of trials that you've taken, the total number of experiments, well, that is going to become the frequentist probability. So in classical probability, you sort of know everything about your scenario. You, you know everything about the deck of cards and how many cards it has, and you're sort of doing this a priori calculation of what the probability should be. But in the frequentist approach, this is great for when you have an imperfect scenario and you don't know what's going on, then you collect a whole bunch of data and you say, well, okay, now I can figure out what the probability is going to be based on my trials. If you have something like a six-sided dice where you do know it, both of these approaches, the classical and the frequentist align. The frequentist, as you do a large number of trials, is going to see that each side comes up about one-sixth of the time. 
and in the classical probability perspective where you know that there's a six-sided dice that are equally likely, again, you'll say each side will come up one six of the time. But the frequentist approach is itself limited. For example, what if you can't just do an enormous number of trials? Like if you're gonna try to predict whether your Tesla stock is gonna go up tomorrow, you can't just take a large number of trials of many tomorrows. You've only got one and you still have to make a prediction. The third approach to probability is gonna be called the Bayesian approach to probability. I've cut the deck one more time and now I'm gonna draw the top card. Except this time, I'm not gonna show you. I can see what it is, but you can't. And so now you can ask the question, what is the probability that this card is a heart? The point here is that it's subjective. From my subjective perspective, where I can see what it is, I have more information than you do, and I know what card it is. But you have a different amount of information. You might have a prior belief that there's a one quarter probability that this is a heart, but then if I flip it over and reveal that it is indeed a heart, you update your probabilities and now you have what is called a posterior probability and you say there's a 100% chance of it being a heart. If I do it again and reveal a new card, well, the frequentists would take a different perspective than the Bayesians because the frequentists wouldn't say that there's a one quarter probability, they'd say, well, hold on, the card is chosen, the card is fixed. There's nothing probabilistic about it. It's 100% hearts or it's 0% hearts. The frequentists have a different philosophical viewpoint here. They might think that their attempt to explain the world by suggesting that it was a heart is something that in a frequentist approach, if you did this many trials over, would be a correct prediction about this objectively right answer one quarter of the time. In contrast, the Bayesian is totally happy thinking that things depend on the amount of information that you have, that it's subjective, and it's not until you gain the new information that this is a diamond that you update your probability to say, there's a 0% chance that it's a heart. We just really wanna think of the Bayesian perspective as you're having these prior beliefs and you're gonna update them to get your posterior beliefs as you gain more information about the world. Okay, so let's return to chess, a game where there is no shuffling of cards, there is no rolling of dice, a game where both players can look at the board and have perfect information about all the data on the board. So how come then that against equally rated players, your chance of winning and your chance of losing are about the same? If you're a frequentist and you'd see this sort of 50-50 behavior, you'd say, well, okay, that does mean you have a 50% probability of winning any particular game. If you're in a more complicated position where say your entire piece up, which at the level I play at, which isn't particularly great. I, I like having fun with chess, but I'm not particularly good. But nevertheless, if you're up a whole piece, it's very, very likely that you're going to win. And so a frequentist can say, well, of the games of which I have been up a piece, I win with a probability of say 95%. From a Bayesian perspective, you might go into the game thinking that about half the time that you're gonna win. And then as you gain new information, you're always updating your probabilistic viewpoint as to whether or not you're going to win. And it doesn't even have to be that like a new piece is moved and that's what updates your impression. It could just be that you're sitting here and you're calculating away and then you realize what the winning idea is. You do have a force checkmate and then you update your probability that you're gonna win accordingly. But where exactly does this probabilistic way of thinking about a, a clearly game of skill like chess even come from? Well, the idea is about bounded rationality. That is, chess has about 10 to the 120 different possible games. It's unfathomably large for a human or even for a computer to be able to just mass calculate everything. We have a sort of bounded rationality, which is we can be rational, we can do calculations a little bit into the future, but then we lose our ability to do that. A common model for how people play chess is you might start up some particular situation and then you've got really three different options that you're considering. Maybe there's many other options, but they're all just sort of either obviously bad or don't really do anything. You just don't bother focusing on them. And then if you have these three options, perhaps your opponent has three options they consider in your response to your three options. And now there's sort of nine possible little trees. And then you might have three things that you're gonna consider to each of the nine things that they consider. You can see how even with just a very small amount of back and force, the amount of calculations you have to do start becoming really large. And the way this really works for probably both humans and, and sometimes explicitly for computer engines 
is that you take these trees and you prune them down and there's a whole bunch of options you're just like immediately don't even think about because they're just sort of obviously bad or obviously pointless and you cut out many of these as well and you're really maybe only considering a choice between just a couple different moves, a couple different paths and try to evaluate whether you think those are good. Imagine for simplicity's sake we can both only see three moves into the future. So we both think we've done a good job, we've looked as far as we're both able to look with our bounded rationality. And then it turns out that one move further than we can think, there's a huge advantage for one player or the other. It just results in the situation like, say, a fork, where you can easily take one of two pieces and gives a massive advantage for one of the players. This is the type of scenario where there's something a bit probabilistic to chess. At the limits of your bounded rationality, it can result in situations that sometimes are fortuitous to you and sometimes ones that really cause a lot of problems. Now, I want to be completely clear. Chess overwhelmingly is a game of skill. Somebody who's even a few hundred rating points better than I am is just going to reliably completely decimate me over and over and over and over again. And, and so would I to someone who is a few hundred rating points beneath me. But when you're matched with someone randomly of your own skill level and the skill becomes equalized, then some of these sort of probabilistic elements like what happens beyond your region of bounded rationality starts to dominate who wins a specific single game. Humans, I think, tend to underestimate the role that probability plays in their lives. Particularly if things are going well, you probably want to attribute it to your hard work and your skill and your dedication. Maybe if things are going really poorly, you say, okay, well then I just had bad luck. But I think the truth is that probabilistic elements actually influence our lives on balance a lot more than people tend to think about. And I think that moving beyond just sort of a classical view of what probability is to a view where it's either a frequentist approach and you're imagining many things happening over many trials or a Bayesian approach where you're updating your probabilities as new information comes in, that this is going to give a broader worldview about how probability affects our lives. I think sometimes math can feel a little bit like magic. If you draw a random card, you can shuffle it back in and then I can find it again easily. But magic tricks aren't magic, they can be understood. And the same is true of math, we can demystify math. And that is why I am so proud to be sponsored once again by Brilliant. We've talked a lot about probability in this video and they have a really cool sequence of courses on probability that take you from the basic fundamentals all to really cool applications like the blockchain. I actually had a ton of fun with their perplexing probability course which is all these cool lessons like the classic perplexing probability example of the Monty Hall problem where there are three doors, only one of which has a prize behind it, and you have to try and win it. Whether you're a magician or a math magician, to really master your craft requires more than just knowing how the trick works. You have to actually practice it. You have to get your hands dirty. And in my opinion, this is where Brilliant really shines. Their courses are incredibly interactive. You're not just taught the material, you get to practice it, you get to play around, you get to have feedback on whether you're understanding the content. As a professor, I know this is just excellent pedagogy and why I'm so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. So go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett, sign up for free, and the first 200 people to use that link are going to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. And with that, if you have any questions about this video, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.